Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest in UCFB's Insight Series. I'm Mark Clement, and how fortunate am I? I love listening to people's career and life stories, and I've done it for a big part of my professional life. I've done it as a broadcaster with BBC Radio and Television, and I do it as an event host, including working with UCFB on their annual Future Leaders Graduates Conference and also launching their global summits as I did in Melbourne in early 2020. Our special guest today is in one of those sporting roles where we don't often get to hear from them firsthand. They're not the stars of the show, but they do make the headlines. And quite simply, football could not run without them. As we welcome Premier League referee, John Moss. So, I would like to know, first of all, the most obvious question that people ask you as a referee or the biggest kind of myth about you guys? Um, I think the biggest myth is that we carry our red cards around with us all the time. <laughs> and generally are quite authoritarian all the way around in general life. And I think one of the surprises that people get when they meet us is that we're just normal people with a sense of humour. And it just so happens that we do a job that we have to exert a little bit of authority from time to time. But I think that's the biggest thing. And, you know, we always get people asking us to show the red card. I mean, it's, you know, the number of times we've been asked that is, you know, wish I had a pound for every time that happened. So you heard me say in the intro that kind of you're not the stars of the show. In fact, you only usually, um, well, actually, I guess a good game for you is when you go home and nobody's talking about you. Would that yeah, be? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? I mean, I think you, you set out your, your game plan is to sort of go unnoticed um, and hopefully you're just there to orchestrate the, the true talent, which is the players. Generally, as a rule, yeah, a good day at the office is when we aren't noticed. Or if we get all the decisions right, that's an even better day when you've got some big decisions to make as well. Okay, so many questions. First of all, as you as you come off, is having been in the game as long as you have, is your is your radar good? Can you tell inside when you've had a good half, or do you ever come off and then maybe an assessor or somebody has said something to you and you realise that you've missed something? I think with coming through the ranks, that was the case. We had a, a good barometer of how you've done. In the Premier League, it's slightly different to that in that everyone on the pitch can accept a decision. You can, everyone's getting on great. And then TV from a reverse angle might find something that proves you to be wrong or incorrect or the angle that always kills us as referees is the one from behind the goal. So the one where you're looking into the pitch and often in the penalty area, we can't see the other side. Obviously with VAR coming off now, the likelihood is that there won't be those phantom incidents that we used to call them as referees before, yeah. before VAR. Yeah. And, you know, and if you, if you get 22 players to agree with you on the field of play, they've got the same view as you. They've thought what you've, thought at the time but often you might be watching match of the day on a on a saturday night and then something will will come and surprise you yeah and that's have, just the nature of it have you been surprised by var at any point this season then where you've gone with the flow gone to make a restart or something perfectly happy with your decision and then the word has come in your ear and you've got what did that what did that happen yeah, i mean at I those moments I've only had one decision overturned, Touchwood, uh, so far, which was at Leicester. I don't know if you remember, it was Leicester against Burnley when there was a notion that um, the defender being tripped as would put the ball into the back of the net. Right. And I think pre-VAR, we probably would have allowed that goal to, to stand. Um, and I was, you know, I was a bit surprised when it was was overturned. But that's that's what VAR is there for. It's there to to in the world of forensic examination it's there to to get you out of trouble really and, and you know although i didn't think it was a foul at the time having seen it back and you know the where we were with var in that process i think it was the correct outcome has it made your 
job completely different? Do you feel like you're in a completely different profession now? Um, I, lo- I like it, if I'm honest. Um, I think it's that reassurance. You, you, you make, obviously, decisions on the field of play like you always have done. And now you've got that added security that if it's a clear and obvious error that someone's going to get you out because there was no worse feeling as a referee driving home knowing that you'd made an error and you know because the the speed of the game the intensity the the number of chances that go on there's always going to be times when it's almost impossible to get the correct outcome and that's what's great about VAR it helps you to do that obviously fans have had a mixed reaction to it. But I think it's work in progress. It's not. It's not finished yet. And just as when you were broadcasting football matches ten years ago, I'm sure it's changing now. When you've streamlined that process and how you were when you first started your job, in, in a new section to it, it takes you a little bit of time to streamline and get better and make it more dynamic. I suppose. I mean, in terms of overall assessment, do you watch every game you've refereed back yourself? afterwards does somebody else do it and then give you a highlights compilation what's the <laughs> there's no highlights in my refereeing career um, <laughs> the, no, basically we get instant feedback at the stadium off the tv guys as we're coming off managers have got a 30 win- minute window to tell you what they think generally they don't come in unless something really contentious has happened we then get a, a delegate uh, an ex-player ex-manager comes in talks to us after the game about the decisions and goes to anything that they're concerned about and then part of the process on the technical side of refereeing is done by an, what's called an evaluation system and that's really evaluating every single decision uh, throughout the game whether it be a throw in a foul a free kick not given so we have to watch every game back in order to answer the questions that the evaluate evaluator might have it's sort of brought up with us and then we're allowed to give our opinion on why we give a decision was it for game management things like that so it's um yeah we're forced to watch the games back unfortunately and and are you quite a, a stringent sort of self beater upper because from the encounters that we've had you're a very laid back guy but are you quite self-critical are you looking at your position on every every bit of play and assessing exactly where you are and how you ran and who you bumped yeah, into. Yeah, I mean, I've got that, I've got like a, a dad run, so I, I tend not to try and look at that too <laughs> too closely. Um, yeah, I think as you get older, you can put things into context and where you used to beat yourself up about every single little thing, you realise as you get a little bit wiser that that's not healthy. Um, yes, you want to get every decision right, um, and I think it's about when you don't get those decisions right, evaluating and looking at where you were, what you could have done better. But where it used to stay with me for probably a week and I was in a bad mood for a while, it, it doesn't last that long now. And I can rationalise that a little bit better now and uh, move on quicker. But that's come with time because you are, as a referee, we're judged on being almost getting every decision right. So you judge, you have to be perfect. But in the real world, there's no player that's perfect that you know every play is a bad pass a missed tackle but when you're playing football you just tend to forget about those where we're almost similar to a goalkeeper a goalkeeper can make 10 great world-class saves and then one that he just gets a finger to right and it goes in the back of the net and they're judged on that rather than that's probably similar to refereeing in a sense sorry to ask you a sort of light and fripperous question but you mentioned your running style and things because it's now a a, a sort of global entertainment industry are you conscious of all that kind of stuff you know i coach uh, coaches and and managers in communication and presentation skills and i'm constantly saying we're all all the time leaving our imprint on the world every single thing we do somebody is getting an impression so are you conscious of that or as you're going out you make sure you're neat and smart and your collar's not up and you i mean is it is you can see my problem? hair now. You can see well, that I'm not that bothered. Well, we need to talk about that one in a minute, don't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> obviously, you want to, like any uh, workplace, you want to look smart as you go out to, to the best of your ability. And then we're in the business of communication, aren't we? So one, we've got to be able to communicate with the players and sell decisions, if you like. But we've also got to be able to communicate with the global global audience. So we've got to be able to tell them why we're making decisions. And one of the things you do, like you've just mentioned there you look at your body language and, and and is the message your body's 
giving what you want to project. So you've got to look confident with decisions. You've got to make sure that your body language is strong in certain situations. And all those things are things that you might self-evaluate on afterwards. And yeah, the running style, there's not a lot you can do with that. You work with, you know, spring coaches and things like that. You try and make yourself look dynamic. But, you know, I think we're really judged on getting those decisions right. And everyone's different. Um, so whereas some referees look more athletic than others, you know, ultimately we're still judged on the same thing, and that is getting key match decisions correct. So are you guys, you mentioned body language. Uh, do you guys do a lot of training into this then, into nonverbal communication, every look, every gesture, whether open, whether pushing people away? You, you spend a lot of time and energy studying that. Stuff, yeah, we'll you? often look at St George's Park, obviously pre-virus. We, we met every sort of two weeks. We look at clips. We're quite, a, um, we're quite a close group, so we can have honest and open, frank discussions, fierce conversations, if you like, to be able to say that that looked good, that didn't look good. This is how it come across. And I think in any organisation, if you want to get better, then you've got to have those frank constructive discussions haven't you and if your body language is weak at the time or if you're betraying the wrong information then it's something that you need to reflect on and we work with our sports psychologists we work with sports scientists in order to be able one fit enough to get into the right position but then once you're there your body language needs to be strong enough to sell a decision because even if you get a decision right and your body language looks weak the players will pick up on that and not buy into what you're trying to sell and every one of them will have their own way of assimilating information, will have their own characteristics. So in, I mean, I know you're dealing with the same players again and again. I don't know how many times will you referee a, a one team over the course of a season? How many times do you think you'll, you'll cover? It depends, it depends yeah. on if anything happens in the game. Uh, but generally, you probably do your Man United, Man City four or five times a season. Um, yeah. And then... You know, some, some other clubs you might only visit once. I mean, I don't referee Newcastle coming from that part of the world. Um, so that means I probably get other teams more because it's one team I can't referee. Yeah, I get you. I get you. So do you study or have info packs on the individual teams, the player characteristics? Is that part of your match preparation that you know – a certain player will do certain things in certain situations, will maybe be more physical, somebody else will be more ma mouthy. Are you, are, have you got kind of profiles on everybody to ready no. yourself to go? No, no, I think it's more generally from a refereeing point of view where we're going to stand if if corners, we, we might have things like where teams line up for corners and things like that, We, you know, where fouls are committed. If someone's doing something in the penalty area, we might be looking closely at that. But I think you build up your relationships with players over time. So you've got to get them to trust you um, and you'll make mistakes along the way about how you speak to players and how they react to you. But that's part of life's experience, isn't it? How I was as a referee 10 years ago in the Premier League is very different to that now. And, you know, you, there's a, you're a little bit worried when you first start in the Premier League, but now you're a bit more laid back. The players trust you. You've got years of experience. You're not always going to get on, but at the end of the game, generally it's a handshake and a laugh and we move on to the next game. And that develops over time, just similar to what you do. I mean, we've known each other for a long time now and, you know, we've always got on well. But there'll be people that you have to work harder with to to build up, that, you know, whether you're interviewing someone, there'll be some that interviews that are easier than others. And similarly, it's the same for us as referees. We're always trying to build relationships uh, and find out how players work and, you know, so we can get the best out of them, really. Mm. I think your coffee's ready. Is that? Is That's that... your daughter, that. Mate. We've got six people in our house at the moment. Two of them are back from uni. Oh, right. And, um, and two younger children uh, who are still homeschooled. But, uh, right. But, yeah, but, so... still, but still, you didn't trust any of them to clip your hair. You decided to do it yourself, mate. Well, I got a little bit to the sides there, but, yeah, generally. We, we all, the three of us had a bit of a head shave, so... It, it, it passed an hour that or two, you know, got a lot of time to fill in. So here's the thing. What's the buzz then? So we've established you're not the stars of the show. We've established you've had a good game if you're going home and there hasn't been too much controversy. So so I guess the fundamental thing is why do you 
do it. What's in it for you? And um, I think when you first start refereeing, it's a, I, I, I always played football and then sort of fell into refereeing through teaching. But um, and it was a, it was a bit of a strange transition, really. It was you went from team sports, playing a lot of football with all your mates, socialising afterwards, and then you start refereeing. It's a very um, a lonely place to begin with because you're by yourself. You often sitting in the changing room waiting to to go out there and, and referee. When I first started, it was Sunday morning football, Saturday afternoon, like lowest level. And you have, it takes you a little bit of time to adjust to that. And then you start working in teams. So when I started working as an assistant, low right down the rank, semi-professional football, referees talk about different things. They talk about whistles when I first started. And it was like, oh, God, this is not for me. <laughs> and then sort of six weeks later, you're doing the same conversation. And then... Football sort of evolved and it went from being a hobby into a, into a job. And, you know, there's no greater feeling as a, as a referee, referee in any game of football, being part of, especially in the Premier League, you've got probably the best seat in the house. You, you're right involved in the action. You see some fantastic goals. There's the buzz there. When you walk out with the ball and the crowd, football, I love football. So I, I would go and watch football. I, used to, I mean, I go and watch Sunderland when I haven't got a game. And this, that excitement when the teams walk out as a fan, that's still the same as a referee, but you have to be part of that. If it's a big game, then you've got all the drama that's associated with that. And then we also have, it's, it's, I suppose it's like it's the only job where every Monday there's that initial excitement because we get an appointment at, at four o'clock on the Monday. I mean, you never know where you're going. So Monday at four o'clock, email drops. And all of a sudden you're either doing a big game or you've got a, a game that's got a relegation, whatever. And so you get that excitement buzz every week. Um, so that's what keeps you alive. And I suppose it, football, this, you know, you love football like I do. And you, it's just, it's in your blood, isn't it? And you, if you can be involved in the highest level, then show you that's the buzz from that really. So you don't know where you are in the pecking order of referees. You don't have a feel for where you might get sent. You wouldn't have a certain kind of style that might suit a particular sort of battle going on? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the guys who uh, our management team who select the referees will take all that into account. Sometimes as a referee, you're in form. Sometimes you're a little bit out of form. Um, sometimes as a referee you see the ball and it seems massive and you find it really easy to make decisions other times it can seem like the size of a marble and you're fighting for every decision and every throw in is a ricochet with about four different hits and you're fighting for every decision um, obviously when you've been in the Premier League a long time like I have then you, you just more you can do most games um, and you know it's not a case of being where you are in the pecking order. It's just which is the right match official team for for that game. Um, and it can be, you know, past games that you've had, relationships with the teams and things like that. Uh, how how When you had the team before, there's lots of things to take into account. And so, yeah, we don't know exactly where we're going. You can have an idea if you haven't refereed a, a team for a while that you could go there. But generally, it's a surprise when it comes through. It's exciting. It's like Christmas every Monday. Wow. Do you do you still suffer nerves at any point? No, not really. Um, I think it's good to be a little bit uh, up through a game beforehand. I suppose nerves. How, how do they good. manifest themselves? What? How would nerves affect you? I think it's more of an excitement. You're about to go out. You, you know, we have a very clear uh, warm up procedure. We've got um, people in our change room. We've got masseurs. We've got. You know, we've got people in and out, match day managers, team sheets, meetings with captains, warming up in a, in the in the stadium beforehand, and then sort of eight minutes to we get the nod from TV that we're we're ready to go, and we do our last preparations as a team of match officials, and then you're walking out and you're in the tunnel, you can feel the vibe of the the game already in the tunnel. Uh, if it's a bigger game, then there's lots at stake. Then you know there's pressures from both teams and you can feel that sometimes in the tunnel and then you're walking out and the crowds are up and, and, and you're getting to go. But in terms of nerves, I think it's more of a, an adrenaline rush as you walk out that's controlled, um, knowing that you've got to go and do a job and you've got to be on your metal from the first second because you could have a big decision 
after eight minutes or one minute and you've got to be ready and switched on. Mm. Do you, I mean, throughout your career, have there been moments and there'll be lots of people that are maybe at the start of their career in their various job roles that will take inspiration from this. Have you had some of those kind of act as if moments where you've had to give yourself a stern talking through to sort of get out the other side and walk into a room or out on a field and you know you're in control even though inside you're or, or below the surface the little duck feet are flipping along yeah i think it's always when you've got when you're making decisions in front of millions of people i mean there's not many jobs where the level of scrutiny that we're under from a, a global audience it's imagine you going to work and people being able to judge every single decision you make in that period where you're at work. So, yeah, you touched on it earlier, that body language appearing to be calm when inside you might be feeling completely different. Um, and there's times when you you know you've made an error um, because of the reaction of the players, because of uh, the crowd. You can sense that you've done something's not quite right. And it's about them moving on, parking that decision and being strong enough to not let that manifest. Because what you don't want is a, a series of poor decisions based on one because you're still thinking about it. So what's really important as a referee is that ability to park a decision. And that's where our sports psychologists come in, to park a decision, move on really quickly and, and make sure that the next one's the correct one and, and you take strength from that. And that develops over time, that strength of character. But it's like any workplace, isn't it? You, some days you have good days at the office, some days you have bad. And in the best people and the ones that do well in any workplace are the ones that are able to reflect on it and then put it right the next time. There's no point mm. in dwelling on things. It's best to move on, I think. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you totally. I love, but you know, I remember hosting an event with a, um, a Red Devils pilot and they're so close when they fly in formation. I said, mate, I, I, I made the audience I was with on that day put their hands up and says, who's made a mistake in, at work in the last 24 hours? And, and virtually 95% of the room put their hands up. And I said, mate, you, you don't have the room for error. So it's, it's strange the margins that apply to different roles across society, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but we're judged so critically, I think that's what amazes me that people make, um, evaluate our performance based on a high definition, slow motion replay from an angle that we don't have. You know, we, the statistics show that we get 99% sort of, of those decisions right at high speed. And if you were doing performance management, you know, it's like I, I always, the analogy I use is, from my school days is that air traffic controllers, you go to an air traffic controller performance management meeting and what's your target? It's to get 100% of the planes down yeah. safely. Yeah. Where do you go from there? Because yeah. you can't get any more than that. And for us as referees, we're, we're expected to be 100% correct all the time. And that's impossible. Um, so it's about how you then you, you set your mindset slightly different to that. Hmm. It, it, it is impossible to be correct all the time because I realised I made a mistake asking you the question and called them the red devils when I meant to say the red arrows. So it just goes yeah. to show. See, I, I made a note of that to, to did, put yeah. it on Twitter later on just to say. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can give me, you can give me pelters. Is there, <laughs> I mean, I know you said you, it had changed over time, but that quickly parking things that you think you've got wrong in your head, is there a simplified version of that you can – share with us that would help people that you know are having those moments all the time because you what you're talking about is you might have that on five minutes in and then have another one come up a couple yeah. of minutes later whereas a lot of us might go by three o'clock in the afternoon oh i'm having a bad day so i'll yeah. just do a bit of admin and i'll get home early you ain't got that option mate no i think we talk about releasing the balloon that's what our sports scientist talks about and sports psychologists and that is if you, you imagine that you've you've made a decision, it's, it's a balloon in your hand, and if you hold on to it and carry on, it becomes a bit of a bind, carry it all around. So it's releasing that and trying to get rid of it as quick as possible so that you're then from a, a, in a fresh start. And don't get me wrong, it, you, you will start thinking about stuff if you dwell on it. But because our game is so fast and, and, and moving forward, 
then we haven't got time to think about that. We've got to be able to release it. We've got to be fully focused on the next decision. And we have our whistle on a, on a lanyard, which is elasticated. One of the other things it tells us to do to keep switched on is to have those moments when you sort of almost ping it against your arm to switch yourself back on again. If you feel as if you're just switching off, it's just those little triggers to, to keep you motivated because when I'm refereeing, we break it down into manageable blocks. It's about getting through the first 10 minutes. And in my team, we have 10 minute blocks and then, and then we start like, right, let's go for the next 10 minutes. And rather than think it's almost like when you go for a long run, if you think about, God, I've got 13 miles to do in this half marathon, it, it, it can be overbearing at times, breaking it down to those sort of half mile blocks. It just makes sure that the quality remains in those small windows and then you know there'll be times when you've got challenging 10 minutes but that lends itself to having an easier 10 minutes further down the line because you've done your hard work then um, are the players indulging if if there has been an error or perception of an error are the players indulging in gamesmanship there with you by they're, they're getting in your ribs and going oh you've had one there ref oh you've had one there ref you're gonna have to correct that are they are they on you all the time yeah, of course they are. I mean, that, they, football's all about gaining those marginal gains, isn't it? Um, yeah. But we've been there a long time, and equally so, we can also go like this. Yeah, they've just told me I've got that right. Well, I'm not having that conversation at all, am I? But that, it, it works both ways, doesn't it? And that, you know, it, it, it can, it can, it's all about, it's a duel in a sense, isn't it? Football, it's two teams battling against each other. It's players... It's crowds trying to get an advantage over the other opposition. And we're just part of that tapestry, aren't we? And we we try and players try to, to cajole you. They'll, they'll know what they're going to get from me. I know what I'm going to get from certain players. And it's that battle that we have during the game to try and get the most. I, I want those players to work with me. I want the captains to stop me from having to yell a car, people by managing their players. So it works works both ways. Um, and we're all trying to get the most that we can out of the teams that we're working with. Mm. You, of course, have another asset, which is your your face, your refereeing face, which you <laughs> shared with me when I came to see your football focus feature. Um, it, I, I had to get you to do it twice. Are you able to? Do you need a moment? Can you? Can no, you just... I can. I can switch it on like that. You see what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> there, it is. there it is. It wouldn't be out of place, was it? Was it a Ben Stiller movie about a male model or something? I think he used Zoolander. to do that. Zoolander. Zoolander. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to do that on the on the catwalk, <laughs> didn't he? So the the other urban myth, which you can this is a pointless question because I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The other urban myth is if you have made a mistake, that I suppose this would be in the olden days before VAR brought it up. You're leaving it up later in the game. No, not really, because we're, we're, I mean, it, it is a myth that um, because we, we, we're evaluated in marks and we have a merit list based on the the key match decisions that you get right. So if you get a decision wrong, that's one mark against you. If you then even it up, it would be two and you'd lose, you know, your standing as a referee. You just judge every decision based on the information you've got. And you try to get that right. Um, and I think sometimes when we make errors, what where we can live with that error is when you can understand why you've made it. So if you, from your position, it, that's what it looks like and everybody else thinks it's a penalty or a free kick, then that's what it looked like on the field of play. And, you know, that's the difficulty. You don't want to be even things up because sometimes players can say you've got it wrong and you show it back later and you've got it 100% right. Mm. If you always think about, do you remember that decision in Middlesbrough I think it was Middlesbrough Man U, I think, or something like that, at, at the Riverside. It looked miles offside. The guy puts it in the back of the net from years ago. And everyone in the stadium thought this goal was offside. The referee obviously got a win that he thought was offside. He went over to his assistant and he's obviously asking him, should we get ourselves out of jail here? Have we got this wrong? The assistant stuck by his decision. The guy's about four yards onside. It just, the way it moved like that, it just looked like it was. And that's sometimes the perception in the ground might be that you've got a decision wrong, but factually you might have got it right, you know? So it's, there's that side of it as well. Yeah, I, we, uh, I'm just letting this conversation go wherever it goes, but then I need to fill some gaps at times. So, yeah, and no, I, prom 
I promise you I'm not uh, making this mistake centric, but insulation, you've already alluded to it. Your average, I don't know, office worker typing away, mixed type typo, hasn't got 40,000 people around them going, you got it wrong, you got it wrong. How do you insulate yourself against all that noise, all mm. those opinions that are swirling around and still stay in control of the game? Um, I think one of the things is that we work as a team, first of all, as four match officials. So we've got our comms kit on in one ear. We've got all the players talking to us in the other ear. Um, now we've got VAR, so six people potentially spinning around in your head. Um, yeah, you've got background noise of the crowd. Um, but that seems, I know it sounds strange, but it seems to just wash over you a little bit because you're concentrating a little bit. It's a bit like having your headphones on when you're running. You don't hear the traffic noise as much. And that's very similar to when you've got a conversation going on, you're analysing decisions. You don't often hear what the crowd's going on. And the best thing I ever did was going carry on going to watch Sunderland and hearing the crowd shout at the referee and the complete nonsense that gets shouted where they're factually wrong in law um, or just complete rubbish. So you've got to remember that when you go to a match, you, as a fan, I've done myself, you just shout rubbish, don't you, sometimes? And anything to vent your frustration about your forward not scoring a goal and it's rather than have a go at your own team, you have a go at match officials and things like that. So I think it's all pantomime, some of it. So it's about filtering out what you need to. And we're so busy concentrating on what's going on, on the pitch, fully concentrating that uh, you don't hear a lot of the background noise. But that, that must come with maturity, doesn't it? And you must, I mean, you've got the family around you there, you've already shared with us. They must have supported you at times when you have had those moments when it's staying with you for days and days and days afterwards. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's been some challenging times in my refereeing career in terms of where you've made perceived errors or, the, you know, things haven't gone according to plan. When you've come in, you've thrown your bag into the corner, you've kicked the dog, and then you don't speak to anyone. Not literally, night. folks. He doesn't not mean literally, No, not literally, yeah. metaphorically. Yes. Um, it, it's... You know, there are challenging times because you want to get things right. You you want to be the best you possibly can be. Um, and that's frustrating when things don't go according to plan. I think the reason it takes referees a long time to get to the very top. I know people ask us why in this country we have some of our referees are slightly older. I think when you're refereeing in front of millions of people, you have to build up those layers of mental strength to be able to to officiate at the top level because it is a place where you will get found out if you're not mentally strong enough and i think that comes from refereeing at the lower levels doing your apprenticeship if you like going through leagues one and league two the championship now is so high profile some great teams in there and then when you get onto the premier league you're ready to take those first steps into that high profile environment and and that sort of a, makes you ready to be able to refereeing a game of football is quite simple it's all the other stuff that goes with it the media side of it the level of scrutiny and and people having an opinion on everything that you do and making direct derogatory comments about you and you know i, I you know if you went onto any referee's twitter account we have parody accounts. We don't have our own, but if you put any referee, referee's name in, some of the stuff that's written on about them is just, it's just not right, really. Hmm. How you does know, that that's, I mean? That's the world we're living in. It is the world we're living in. It's not right. We all know it's not right. But when it's written about you, I mean, again, how do you, how do you deal with that? Other than, I suppose, get the, the organisation that looks after the referees to, to sort of, chase Twitter down to get the account taken down. But yeah, again, I mean, how do you we, deal with it? We don't have a Twitter account. I mean, I don't have... No, don't I know you them. don't. Yeah. I know you don't. But if a parody account is, or, or some, yeah, something yeah. very critical has been written about you, I mean, again, how do you deal with it? What do you do to get it out of your head? I think if you go and looking for things, you find them, don't you? Mm. So I don't go looking for things. You know, I don't go... 
we are the, the record shop has a Twitter account, but we just talk about records really on there. And I don't, it's only when people think they're being funny and draw their, your attention to it, if they've seen something about you on Twitter and you get sent it, then that's the only time that I would look for it. I don't, you know, I, yeah, yeah. whatever people want to write about you, they'll write about you. It doesn't have any bearing on my life whatsoever. It's just, some of it's quite funny. I've got to be honest. Some of it is amusing and but some of it is just like, they've got nothing better to do with the time then that's up to them how they want to spend it isn't it and that's more a reflection on society and that person rather than on me as such but yeah i don't really bother looking to be honest yeah you've got to be enormously thick skinned to have achieved what you have john surely i i think it's that case of thick being thick skinned it's just if you if you go looking for everything that's written about you yeah Generally, people write negative things. Well, you never get a, a great piece written about a referee. That's the nature of how referees are perceived around the world, not just in England. So it's it's a case of anything that's going to be written about referees is probably going to be have a negative slant based around mistakes, whatever. So I think it's about compartmentalizing that in your brain, thinking, well, if that's what it's going to be, then don't go looking for that and. You just got to believe that what you're doing is is good, and and you're doing it for the right reasons, and you make decisions based on that. And often, what I find fascinating is when people actually get to speak to you and ask you questions away from football, um, and if we do an after dinner or or whatever, and people have a chance to speak, the perception of referees is completely different. They think we're a certain type of person, and generally we're not. Uh, we think that. We want to spoil games of football. Of course, we don't. Um, and I think as refereeing goes into the 21st century, I think one of the things that we need to work hard on is changing that perception. And, you know, I think having more avenues to for you to get to know the referees. And I, I don't mean that to make us a little bit more infamous or whatever. It's just a case of having the opportunity to explain things and, People are fascinated when, about refereeing. They're fascinated about why decisions are made, what you have to do, and the train that you have to undertake. And I think that that would benefit football in general if people had a bit more understanding of why things are done. Will you Will you take us back to the start? It's probably a question I should have asked you about half an hour ago. But you know, you've mentioned your long career in the game and how long it took to get to the to the Premier League and the amount of time you spent there. Just give us a whistle stop around the steps that got you to where you are now, please. And don't forget to mention that you were James Milner's PE teacher because obviously <laughs> everybody saw the headline when you sent him off Liverpool, yeah, his Palace last season as well. Yeah, yeah. So basically. I actually grew up in Newcastle. I was always um, I played football to a, to a reasonable stand. So that was the county I played in the same under sixteen side as Alan Shearer. We were national champions of boys clubs, so we played boys club team. So we won at Villa Park against Bath Schools in nineteen eighty six. Um, I was signed for Sunderland. He was, I think, he was a. But the, everybody in our team was signed for somebody. And it's probably how difficult it is to make it as a professional footballer that. The only person you probably know from that team is 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 Alan Shearer. And then we, from there, I was at Sunderland's a school boy, got released, went to Millwall, spent some time at Luton whilst doing A-levels because my dad was quite into my studies, travelling to London during the week uh, to play for Millwall and stuff, just the juniors because obviously we are part of the apprentice scheme. And then I was also playing for the county, um, so we became champions Northumberland and through that I got a scholarship to go and play in America whilst I was doing my A-levels it was the start of um, PE A-level and they were just trialing some uh, some of the curriculum see how that would work and we did a year's course of PE at sixth form and part of that was qualifying as a, a basketball referee so I did pick, I am a trained uh, basketball uh, referee, uh, a football. Do you not need to be tall for that? I never think of you as I, I, I never think of you as extraordinarily tall. Do you not? Need to <laughs> no, be no, no. So basketball right. trained as a rugby uh, referee and a football referee. Um, so when I went to university in America, I spent a year there, and then my mates came over to visit. Um, 
whilst I was coaching and we had such a good laugh that when I took them back to the airport, they said, why, why don't you come back with us to, to Leeds? That's what they're all at Leeds Uni. And we've had such a good laugh being stupid over the summer. I just said, yeah, I will. I'll come back with you. So I just got my passport, got my stuff and came back from America. Spur of the moment, John. Yeah. yeah. Absolute. Yeah, spur of the moment. My mate, when we got to the, uh, we landed at Heathrow, he ran his tutor from Leeds Union said, oh, I've got my mates because come back and they come. So I went, I, I literally on the Tuesday went, uh, had an interview at Leeds Union, got in. Um, and then, so I played for British universities. I went to Cambridge when I was there and I'd, I'd started refereeing just, when I went back from university, I, I started um, just for beer money, really, just doing weekends, Got managed to get promoted. And then as I started teaching, I started doing kids' games as well at the same time. Uh, so I'd do all the kids' games after school. Obviously, you've alluded to me teaching James. That was early on in my career. He, you know, he was in year six and I was their teacher. And we also did the district team. I coached that. And then... I was playing semi-pro football as well, sort of going down the, the ladder. Um, and I ended up getting sent off playing for a team in Leeds. Um, and basically the player booted me off the ball. I turned around and I booted him back and because um, it was blood and thunder league and you had to be tough in that league. And um, the referee sent me off. So I, I went in the bar afterwards. I said, look, there's any chance of you not, not sending that up? sending off in and um you know it was a it was a spare of the moment thing you missed that and he said no i'm definitely sending it in and if you think you can do any better have a go yourself so i served a 35 day suspension because that's what the standard was for getting sent off and after that started refereeing so i never played football um again um and i started refereeing so started doing lead sunday league um which was a real eye opener. It's just dealing with drunk people on a on a Sunday morning. Got promoted quite quickly. Um, then got onto the the ladder of professional, sort of semi professional pyramid. So, and I went bang, bang, bang. So within five years, I was on the football league. And um, that lad who said, "If I think I can do any better," ended up running my line a couple of times as I was coming through. Oh, I bet nice. that felt. <laughs> it's quite nice. I, I wish he'd sent that in there. He hadn't sent it in there. You know, everyone would have been relieved. I would never have refereed. Um, and then ended up on the football league for a while, and then did okay and got, and got into the Premier League. But it all started because I was doing kids games after school and things like that. And it's weird, really. It starts as a as as my teaching career was starting to take off, and I managed to get to be a head teacher. The two careers sort of ran parallel to a point where they both came to a pinnacle. I'd, I was working at school in Halifax as a head, and you had to make that decision that you couldn't do both full time. And I made the decision that I could go back to teaching and <clears throat> decide I was going to have a bit of time where I was just going to concentrate on my refereeing career. And obviously, took a full time contract with the Premier League. and they allowed me to just work one day a week. So I was doing a lot of consultancy as a head. And then, um, and then last April, I finished a, a job in Tombardin, which is in just on the border of West Yorkshire and just sort of concentrated on refereeing and we opened the record shop at the same time. I've always been all right with teaching. The schools I've worked with have done well. And I think sport has been a big thing about that. And I think, you know, the kids would often see me on TV and we talk about that and it helped with some, we had some really challenging children at the time and it helped that I, you know, they sell me on TV and we could use that football as a, as an avenue to, to help them to do things with their life really. Cause all the children, all the schools I've worked with have been in really challenging areas. So you, you know, so football was something that people and sport in general is something that is an avenue for them to you know when their life wasn't going so well at home that they could take part and we've always really pushed the sports side in the schools that have worked in so the children have to behave to be able to take part in sport but if they do that and they, and they work hard in the lessons then they get 
we used to do as many different competitions as possible. A lot of our kids couldn't afford football boots and trainers, so we made sure that all the children had a tracksuit and they had the, the right equipment. So when they walked in, even though we got hammered from time to time, we looked the part, and that was part of it. And as a result of that, a lot of our children end up going to grammar schools and things like that. Um, just by, you know, one of the things that we, we, we found out about the children in deprived areas was in Halifax, they have a, a grammar school system where you have to take an exam to get into a grammar school. So in our school, none of our children um, were all Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Eastern European children. None of them had ever gotten to the grammar school. And then I thought, well, why, why is that? Why is that the case? And then it was this exam you had to do. It was, you had to, it was all inference and number stuff that our children had no access to. So we got a tutor to come in and started tutoring our children. So we thought we may as well put them on an even keel. So we paid for that, for them to do that. And then bit by bit, we got 20 kids into the grammar school and it was about opening wow. those doors. I've gone slightly off tangent here, but it was about opening those doors to the children to make sure that they had the opportunities to to take part in sport, but also had life choices as well. Yeah, but you, so, you, you you're right. We 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 have swirled around, but it's a kind of indication as to the sort of roundedness of your life, which has got many different elements to it. And you've mentioned the record shop a couple of times, which is something we collaborated on when I came to see yeah, it for one football focus earlier in. This, this football season, which is a, is that, is that a passion project or is that with one eye on when you have to retire for refereeing and maybe don't want to go back to teaching full time or what, what, what is it, would you say? Yeah, I think that what I found frustrating with the head teacher stuff. So we, both the schools that have been head at, we've both got, they've all got to be outstanding. They've all got to, to be looked at by other schools as being successful when you have to do it but it's a full-time job to be able to do that you've got to be on the ball you've got to be active stuff and you can't do that i've what i found frustrating was i couldn't do that part-time i couldn't do it whilst concentrating training and all the things that go with football and therefore you weren't as i didn't think i was being as um quick to change things around as i wanted to where the record shop comes in it's it is a passion of mine it's something i've always been interested in as, and i love um but it's also something i can do by the time that i've got available um, mm. do we want to be the best record shop in the country of course we do but that'll take a bit of time to develop that i i always want whether it's teaching or headship or schools is to do the best possible job we can do and I am passionate about the teaching side of things and education, and but it needs to be a fully focused thing. I can't do that just with one eye on it. And I think to move things around and to make a real difference, you have to you have to give a lot of your time to do that. And that's something I might go back to. I don't know. There might be jobs in football. You know, I think a lot of transferable skills. Or to me, it's about managing people. So it, whenever, whenever I went into a school, it was always in challenging situations. Either the head had left, the, there was trouble at the mill, there was something going on. So I had to, one, get staff to work with me. I had to, two, get them to believe in the vision that we're trying to get to. So often it's about taking barriers away to stop people complaining. So... One of the things, the government have a thing called PPA, which is uh, planning preparation time. So every teacher is allowed 10% of their curriculum off to plan. So what would often happen is we'd all be timetabled. You have to get cover into that class. Within that class, um, some of the lessons would suffer because you've got a substitute teacher in there, supply teacher in. There wasn't a flow. So I decided that, and, and often teachers wouldn't go home they would spend time in school they get a child would misbehave they get distracted from that gives them something to complain about so i thought what would be better is why don't we start school early finish slightly later but why don't we finish on a friday afternoon at 12 o'clock the children can stay at school and we'll just do sport we'll do art we'll do all different clubs and we'll get people in to do that 
which doesn't need that skill set to do that control children doing things that are like and all the teachers can either stay in school do all the work so they get the free weekend or they can just go away for the weekend but know that they've got that to do it's a different way of thinking about ppa but one it saves money two children are getting something out of it and three it gets the staff on board and i think football record shops teaching need to think outside the box we've always done things in a certain way we've always done refereeing in a certain way and it's about thinking about how we can change the perception of referees change the perception of teaching you know record shops this is how record shops look like but why does it have to look like that could it be slightly different and i think it's just trying to do things differently which has a benefit I've never been one for paperwork, teachers doing paperwork for the sake of it and stuff like that. I know I've gone off tangent here, but it alludes back to those passions, really. And this comes back to referees. We're not just cardboard cutouts. We're not, we do think about things, and but we also have a personality and we, are, we have a sense of humour as well. But I think anything in life, you've got to have a passion about something to make it work. And we're passionate about refereeing and football just as the supporters are. I hate it when someone get beat. It puts me in a bad mood. I hated getting beat as a footballer. My dad just didn't used to speak to me at night if I played badly as a footballer. So, you know, I think it's all about those ingrained things in any workplace, in any job. You've got to have those passions to be successful. So if we were picking your top three life career tips for anybody watching, take your opportunities. I mean, it seems to me like two of the big junctions in your life were made almost on the spur of the, the moment. Would it be take, take, take the, the things when they come along, be passionate, and what would the other one be? I think it's to find a job that you love because it doesn't feel like a job. I never feel as if I'm going to work, going out training, I love it. I love going to matches and I love refereeing and that will end at some point. Equally so, I loved going as a teacher to school and, and changing people's lives for the better and having an impact. Yeah, there were days when an age job where it was hard work harder than others. But I think you've got to be a risk taker as well. And I don't mean that flippantly. You've got to be a risk taker and take calculated risks and challenge yourself and put yourself out of a comfort zone. If you are one of those people that just stay in one place and stay in a place where you feel comfortable, you'll never be successful. You've got to always put yourself and do things that make you feel really uncomfortable for a moment or two. And that's part of being alive and moving on to the next level in your life and next challenge. You know, there's always going to be times when things don't go according to plan, but it's about bouncing back and believing in yourself and, and taking the next steps forward really. No, John, we started this off by saying we don't get to hear from you guys very often. I wish we did because that was fantastic. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Thanks to John Moss and thanks to you for watching. Join us again soon for another one in the UCFB Global Insight Series. <laughs>